There's a phrase that's often used in these videos when I talk about these design hacks and stuff like that. You know, when the designers are looking at the rule book, it's usually to the effect of, it says here that I'm allowed to do X, but it says absolutely nothing about doing Y. And these sorts of shenanigans happen back in stock car racing in America all the time, usually involving a guy called Smokey Eunuch, who would often find such ways of tricking the governing bodies. Such hacks he pulled off included inflating a basketball inside a fuel tank to make it appear it was holding the regulation capacity of fuel, and then deflating it after those checks were done. And when that trick was discovered, he'd then install another 40 feet of fuel line under the car to hold an extra gallon or so of fuel. Much to the amazement of everybody in attendance when they took that fuel tank out to check if it was legal, only for the car to still be able to drive away. But in Formula 1 though, it's a little bit harder. The rulebook is way more restrictive and it's become almost customary to just ban stuff as soon as it's been developed instead of relying on the teams to make their own version to become semi-competitive. There's things like changes to floors, changes to wings, changes to suspension assemblies, changes to this, changes to that, technical directive here, technical directive there. But in 2010, a system was brought in that was so genius the FIA looked at it and went, yeah, we can use that and now it's become something that people hate. The precursor to that system, though, was called the F-Duct. Up until 2008, F1 cars had become peak aerodynamic insanity. They had aero appendages here, there, and everywhere, and dirty air was the talk of the broadcasts. It's not a 2014 thing, they've been talking about dirty air since at least the early 90s. For the 2009 season, the season prior to this one we're looking at, the cars had become a lot more basic in design. Gone were the aero appendages, the front wing was chonky with a tall rear wing and the cars were sort of a throwback to those mid to late 90s high nose cone designs, but with extra steps. The hope was less aerodynamic gubbins or fewer aerodynamic gubbins and then more overtaking because less dirty air. It was also thought that the lack of rear end grip from the smaller rear wing would mean a harder to drive car and in theory would make cars cheaper to build especially in the aftermath of the global financial crash. And in 2009, we had the infamous double diffuser controversy, something that was covered in a previous video. Basically, Super Aguri engineers had come up with this thing for 2009, and when the engineers split and went to different teams following the team's demise in the 2008 season, it meant that Honda, now Braun, Williams and Toyota all had this diffuser concept that all the other teams rushed to copy. Braun built the best one and was able to win the championship. Moving into 2010, that double diffuser concept was banned, and as always, the engineers started looking at ways to claw back any lost downforce and generate new downforce, especially now since the cars were 20 to 22 centimeters longer because larger fuel tanks, because refueling's banned, and the front tires were made narrower. They went from 270 millimeters at the front to 245 millimeters at the front. Red Bull managed to adapt to these regulations best. When you've got Adrian New, it's probably going to happen, and the RB6 ended up producing at the time the most downforce in the history of Formula 1. Which is Adrian's words, not mine. But despite this, there was no overall indication as to who would win the championship. There was no runaway team in testing, and the opening three winners of the season were Alonso for Ferrari, Button, who had moved to McLaren, and Vettel at Red Bull. But after the Australian Grand Prix, Red Bull went to the stewards to question the legality of McLaren's MP425 because it was doing something that was well, pretty much the opposite to what Red Bull were doing. As we've talked about before, the teams were trying to get any piece of downforce back for cornering speed and lap time, but McLaren have figured out a way of increasing straight line speed without any engine trickery, batteries or movable aerodynamic devices, which were banned under Article 3.15 of the technical regulations. Article 3.15, Aerodynamic Influence. With the exception of the cover described in Article 6.5.2 when used in the pit lane, the driver adjustable bodywork described in Article 3.18 and the ducts described in Article 11.4, any specific part of the car influencing its aerodynamic performance must comply with the rules relating to bodywork, must be rigidly secured to the entirely sprung part of the car, rigidly secured means not having any degree of freedom, and must remain immobile in relation to the sprung part of the car. So when it comes to aerodynamics in Formula 1, the TLDR of it all is air passes over the front and rear wing of the car and pushes it into the ground at the expense of drag. There are other things like gurney flaps and diffusers and stuff like that that can help, but this is just Billy basic terms here. You might have seen back in the old days for races like Hockenheim and Monza, the teams had these rear wings that had a very low angle of attack on them, resulting in less drag and higher top speed. 
McLaren had found a way to somehow get that top speed without these fancy rear wings. And you can do downforce by yourself right now. I mean, you're going to look like an idiot in the doctor's office or at the bus stop, but if you take your hand and then just run your finger across it like that, it's really easy. But if you really push it in, you get more grip, more friction, more purchase, and that's downforce. You know, that teaching degree wasn't wasted, was it? So how did it work? It all started with a small snorkel at the front of the car, and somehow air was directed through the car, through the shark fin at the rear, and then the air exited some outlet in the rear of the car that would cause the rear wing, in effect, to stall. Because F1 rear wings at this time used multiple elements, I mean, they still do, sort of, they could stall one of these two elements and decrease the lift to drag ratio and get somewhere in the region of 5 km an hour extra in a straight line. When the F duct, as it was known, was inactive, the air comes through the snorkel and gets messed around to come out through a neutral part of the rear assembly. When it was active, the air was redirected to the rear wing, and the airflow would come out of an extra slot in the rear wing, which isn't really shown on any 3D models here, but it messes with the airflow on that rear wing, stalls it, and reduces drag. I don't get it either. This benefited McLaren greatly at the Chinese Grand Prix. The race was run in damp conditions and all the other teams were running higher angles of wing to generate more downforce in those wet conditions. But because McLaren could stall the rear wing on that very, 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 very long straight, it meant an extra bit of speed in a straight line. And they were off the pace in qualifying, but during the race, Jensen won and Lewis set the fastest lap. And because of the ban on the aero being operated through levers, buttons and other electronic devices, the whole thing was operated by Hamilton and Button's left leg. They'd close off the hole with their left leg on the straights and that caused the stalling of the rear wing. Then in the corners or the braking zones they'd take their leg off the hole and the aero worked as designed. And because the leg is a driver and not a gadget, it was all totally legal. So I guess it was operated by a button then. But despite it being technically driver operated aerodynamics, the FIA didn't ban it immediately like they probably would today. They left all the other teams to work out what it was McLaren had done, and it was down to them to copy it. But it was going to be made a lot harder because in 2010, chassis had to be homologated. There were also concerns that for some teams, drivers would be going one handed down straights as they covered their own F duct holes, which at 200 miles an hour would result in suboptimal amount of control if something went wrong. But you would be forgiven for thinking that some of these teams deliberately made it so that drivers had to take their hands off the wheel so it was banned faster. So who did manage to copy it? Sauber was the first, bringing their version of the F-Duck to the Australian Grand Prix and their snorkel was on the side pod rather than the nose, but they later moved it to where McLaren had theirs. Mercedes had a system in place for China, but theirs was plumbed in slightly differently because they weren't using a shark fin like a lot of other teams. Ferrari had theirs by Spain but got rid of it as they found performance elsewhere. Red Bull had theirs for Turkey and had a refined version for Silverstone, but their main focus was more on blown exhaust gases that came the following year. Force India and Renault brought theirs a lot later. So you might be wondering, why was it called the F-Duct? I wish there was some sort of cool story behind the nomenclature, but it's simply because the location of the snorkel that started that system was where the F in Vodafone was located on the nose. The part number at McLaren was called RW80. But the FIA saw some use in the system and would start to develop its own response seeing the potential to allow for more overtaking and improving the show. For the very next season, the FIA allowed a full spec part on every single car. There was a driver operated flap on the rear wing that instead of stalling the rear wing, left a gaping hole in there that totally eliminated rear drag and would produce somewhere in the region of 12 to 15 kilometers in a straight line. All right, it doesn't totally eliminate it. It just reduces it. I guess it's a drag reduction system for want of a better phrase. It's become a necessary evil in modern Formula 1. Some hate it. Some think it would be okay with a few rule tweaks to make it not be the slam dunk overtake it has been. But I don't know. Maybe that's a discussion for another day. But you could argue that DRS is all McLaren's fault. You could argue it's Hamilton's fault. I mean it usually is. But anyway, this has been a look back at the infamous and pretty much genius McLaren F-Duct. If you've learned something new here today, then do give the video a like, share it around, watch this video a few hundred times to get the momentum going again because, yeah, I had to take a week off for illness. But, you know, trigger some adverts, do what your kids do, subscribe, like, get more of this talking cue ball. Well, I'm more of a talking red ball at the minute. I mean, look at me.
Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out in the image buying side of things, then you can help out by following the link in the description, where there's also links to Discord and also to my socials. Well, there's super thanks down there too, if you just want to buy me a beer or a coffee or whatever. But in all seriousness, now, imagine if everybody that watched this video donated $1. I could license all the footage I want. A man can dream. But anyway, until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.